Welcome in NBA champion Craig Speedy Claxton to episode 7 of Inside Buzz. I'm your host, Mikey Domegala. Speedy Claxton, Hofstra legend, one time NBA champion. He's one of four 2000 point members at Hofstra University. He also led them to the NCAA tournament in 2000 as a senior. Claxton was then drafted 20th overall by Philadelphia, which was the start of his 10 year NBA career. He played with Allen Iverson, Chris Paul, and even with the San Antonio Spurs dynasty in his career. Claxton was a very serviceable role player and even helped the Spurs win a championship in 2003. To this day, he's a Hofstra legend and he's also an assistant coach for the school. Craig, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Craig, to start it off, how'd you get your nickname of Speedy? One of my former AAU coaches gave it to me, Artie Cox. Uh, before he became my, my coach, I used to play against his team all the time. And he didn't know my name, so he used to just refer to me as the Speedy Kid. And then I went to high school with a bunch of his players, and then the nickname kind of just stuck. So you're a, you're a New York guy. You were born in Hempstead. You went to uh, high school in Queens. Did you always want to go to college in New York, or were you looking elsewhere? I looked elsewhere. Um... Like St. John's, actually St. John's came after me, Seton Hall came after me, uh, Georgia Tech, but it was just something about Hofstra where I felt comfortable with the coaching staff and the environment. And that's kind of what made me decide to go there. So bring me back to the 1999-2000 season at Hofstra. You averaged 23, six and five. You're named Conference Player of the Year. You won the Haggerty Award and you led Hofstra to the NCAA tournament. What was it that made you take that leap from your sophomore season to your senior season? You became a much better shooter. And then I think that's why my, well, I know that's why my scoring uh, increased. Uh, teams, were, teams and players weren't able to play off me, so it made me be able to get to the basket better by adding a jump shot my senior year. And then I think my points became average increased from like 16 to 23. I mean, it was just a huge jump being able to really shoot the ball from the perimeter. So then, you know, the tournament was in March of 2000. You were drafted in June of 2000. So Hofstra was, you know, defeated in the first round of the tournament. Then there's four months from the end of the tournament until the draft. Can you take talk to me about your mindset in those four months leading up to the draft? It was, man, this is, this is my dream on the line. Uh, I had a Put my put work into over, overdrive. Um, had workouts, did workouts twice a day with one of the assistants, coaches that was at Hofstra at the time, Brett Gunner, who is now one of the coaches for the Houston Rockets. Uh, we put in a lot of work preparing for the draft and getting ready. And just to, to be on that NBA scene with the NBA weight workouts, and going through the pre-draft pre pre camps, uh, Chicago, and back back in the days, there was a fans camp also, so I went to the fans camp first, then on to Chicago. So it was just a lot of hard work put in to get prepared for the draft. Who were some of those teams that you worked out for in like the uh, prior to the draft? I worked out for Toronto. I uh, worked out for the Knicks. I worked out for the Clippers. I worked out for the Sixers, worked out for the Magic, worked out for the Celtics, uh, worked out for the Supersonics. A lot of teams. Uh, 11 workouts. So out of those, say, 11 teams, I mean, you're a New York kid. Did you want to go to the Knicks? Of course. I mean, you know, I grew up being a Knicks fan, so that's the team I wanted to go to. And it almost came, it almost happened because I got picked 20th by the Sixers, and the Knicks was picking 21st, and they said that they was going to take me. So I was actually looking forward to it. And then the Sixers surprisingly uh, snatched me up. I think the Sixers was going to pick me. I mean, you know, they had Allen Iverson, they had Eric Snow, Aaron McKee. So I pretty much thought their, their backcourt was intact, and they wasn't picking a guard. So I was really, I wasn't even kind of paying attention to that pick because I didn't think they was going to pick me. And I was really, looking forward to that next pick, which was the Knicks, and hoping that I was going to get picked there. But then when the Sixers uh, got me, you know, it was just like, oh, wow, I was just in the moment of getting drafted, so I didn't really care who got who picked me. 
What was one thing you learned from playing alongside Allen Iverson? That's just how hard you got to compete. I mean, he came out to play every game like it was the last. Um, he was the ultimate competitor. Is there Are there any misconceptions about Iverson that, you know, fans and people in the media have about him? But, you know, you're... You're his teammate. Yeah, What's something you could say? Yeah, there is. He's a, he's a great guy. I mean, just being around him and seeing the attention that he demanded and everybody wanted to get a piece of him, wanted to talk to him, a picture, an autograph. And if he stopped and did all those things for everybody, the man wouldn't be able to, 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 to live a normal life. And that's the thing. AI, he wants to be normal. Like, he wants to do normal things. I remember one time, me and Ronnie Buford um, we was on a road trip and we was in Orlando and we went to um, Universal Studios. So we was talking about it and he was, and I was like, oh, I want to come with you. And me and Ronnie's like, really? Like, you want to go to Universal Studios? He's like, all right. So I already knew. I was like, you know what? It's, this is going to be chaos. Like, we, we're just going there. We, don't, we didn't have any security or anything. And then when we got to the park, we let the security know that we was there. So they walked around with us. And, you know, at first, nobody really recognized him. I mean, nobody's going to recognize me and Ronnie. But <laughs> nobody, nobody really recognized AI. And then one person recognized him and yelled it out. And then it was a mob scene. We had to leave the park. It got so crazy. I'm, looking, I'm like this. That, that got to be insane to, 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 to live like that, man. Like, not only be a superstar in your, sit, in your own city, but to be a superstar everywhere and not walking around, not being able to walk around anywhere, that, that got to be hard. Like, it's a gift and a curse, honestly. You were on one of the greatest Spurs teams. You know, your teammates were Duncan, Ginobili, Parker. And even outside of them, you had uh, David Robinson, um, Steve Kerr, Kevin Willis, and Steve Smith. What was it like playing with all of those legends on one team? Oh, it was great, man. I mean... Growing up and being fans of those guys and then getting to personally know them, know them and meet them and be around them and their family and becoming friends, it was, like, so surreal. Like, I, I, I still to this day can't believe I made it to the NBA. Like, watching the NBA Finals now and reliving the moments when I was there, I'm like, just, dang, that, that's crazy. Like, I really did it. Like, I, I lived my dream. Do you, you have any – I was just thinking, Kevin Willis. I mean, at the time, he must have been, like, 40 years old, right? That was, his last, that was when I played with him. That was his last year. Uh, that was David Robinson last year. That was Steve Smith last year. That was Danny Furry's last year, and Steve Kerr. So I mean, I had a yeah. I played with a bunch of really great guys who had great careers. So for a question about them, I mean, you were a young kid then, and I mean, Tony Parker was like a young kid, same with Ginobili. How was it with like twenty to twenty-two year olds, and then a forty-year-old in Kevin Willis and David Robinson? It was cool. We, I mean, we, we, we had a nice mix. I mean, all the young guys that we had, you know, me, Tony, uh, Ginobili, Malik Rose, Steven Jackson, we, we all kind of was tight. And then you had the older guys, but we still, but we still formed a bond with them because we still do stuff with them. So, like, we would all go to the movies together with our wives or girlfriends at the time or we'd all go out to, to each other's houses and just, spend quality time with each other. And I think that kind of why we wanted that year. Also because we we really had a, a, a tight bond off the court. So we built trust and I think it helped us. So game six of the 2000, 2003 NBA Finals, you checked in halfway through the third quarter and you never left. So the Spurs were down 10, then suddenly they're up 10. You guys went on a 19 to nothing run. And in that time you scored 13 points and had six assists. I mean, on a team with Duncan, Ginobili, Parker, David Robinson, you led them to the title in game six. What do you remember from that game? It's crazy. I mean, at the, at the moment, you don't really realize what you're doing. It's not until now when I'm watching with my family and friends and I'm, I'm looking back I'm like this, Dad, that's crazy, man. I really helped uh, the Spurs win this championship. I was really, really a part of that. Like, I just wasn't on the team. Like, I actually had a hand and helping the team win it. And it's, it's crazy, man, to go up and watch those, all those NBA finals and then to not only be in the finals, but to actually be on the court and w help win it. It's unreal feeling. 
So you saw Greg Popovich coach on a daily basis. What what makes him such a great coach? Great because he first of all he's a he's a great X and O's guys guy, but then he he's a player's coach. Like he treats the first man the same as the fifteenth man. So if you do something wrong, you're gonna get yelled at just the same way as Tim Duncan's gonna get yelled at when he does something wrong. Uh, whereas nowadays, I think these coaches don't yell at the stars as much because they need the stars to be happy in order to keep them with a job. So they they kind of coach the stars different nowadays, but Pop, he doesn't. He coaches everybody the same. You're also a, a teammate of Chris Paul when he was a rookie, when he won Rookie of the Year. And during that season with the Hornets, you had a great year. What do you remember from the rookie Chris Paul? I mean, you just knew he was going to be great. Um, Obviously, I had to compete against him every day. And I thought I was a good player. And I was like, you know what? This guy's going to be special, man. He really is. Because he just knew the game. He was very passionate. He he hated losing any drill. And you could just see the, the the fire that he had in his eye that he wanted to be great. Uh, he he worked at, he, he worked his tail off to to get to the NBA. And once he got there, you could, you could see how well – he bonded with his teammates. Like, everybody respected him. Everybody listened to him. And I we weren't even supposed to have a good team that year, but we, we ended up, like, just just barely just missing the playoffs. And I think a lot of it had to do with uh, with Chris, like, just pushing us to, to being good every day. Yeah, and as you know, like a 20-year-old kid. And I, I believe you guys finished with the 10th seed. So you guys were just on the cusp of the playoffs, like, yeah. like you said. Um, also on that team, I got to ask this question. A young J.R. Smith. I mean, do you do you have uh, you're giggling already? Do you have a funny story about J.R. as a rookie? Oh yeah, it was one of his first couple of seasons. You could just tell that he was gonna be wild. I mean, uh, I don't really remember the story right now, but you could just he, J.R. was just young and immature at that time. <clears throat> but you could tell he was talented uh, and that he was gonna be a a good player in the league. How did you get into coaching? During my last year when I was with Golden State and I wasn't really playing, Don Nelson, who was the coach at the time, came up to me. He was like, yo, you ever thought about coaching? And he's the, he's the one who kind of put it in my head because I, I think he saw that I was kind of like a coach on the floor. And then him and I, him and I had a talk after practice. He was like, I really think you should really think about it. I think you'll be a great coach. Like, you know what you're doing. Guys listen to you. So then that's kind of what started off. And then once my playing career ended, I really didn't right, get right into coaching. I was actually a scout with the Warriors for like three years. But then when Hofstra hired Coach Joe Mahalik, uh, the, an opportunity presented itself to me to jump on his staff. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to come back home to where it all started and help build the program to, to how it was when I was there. I mean, to hear that from Don Nelson, one of the most winning winningest coaches in NBA history, that's that's got to be something special. Oh, yeah. So you're the mentor of former Hofstra star turned 2019 Utah Jazz draft pick Justin Wright Foreman. Can you talk about your relationship with him? A great relationship. Um, that's that's like my that's like that's my little man, man. Whenever he has a problem, uh, whether it be basketball, or personal. He comes towards me. I try to help him out the best that I can. But uh, kind of like how Coach Wright and I are linked, um, I think the same is going to kind of go for, for me and Justin. So I read online that he scored just 44 points as a freshman and that was actually so frustrated that he wanted to transfer. And you were one of the main yeah. reasons why he stayed. Yeah, he did. He did. So yeah, so he, yeah, he, scored, he, he had, a, he, you know, it's a, it's a tough transition from high school to college. And Justin didn't understand that at first. Um, and I just told him to stay patient. Your time will come. And at that, during that year, we had a very good team. So I knew he wasn't going to get that much playing time, which we probably should have registered on him. Um, but I just knew that he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't be able to handle that with one of his fellow incoming freshmen playing a little bit. So I was like, you know, it's just, I'm not going to approach him with, on that topic, and he didn't play that much that year. Um, but you could you could still tell that he was going to be a good player. 
Uh, we just didn't have room for him. Um, we just didn't have time to put him in the, to develop him during that year because we had a championship team. Right now, he's dominating in the G League. He just he just won some kind of tournament the other day. I saw. Are you still in contact with him? Yeah, we I speak every we speak practically every day. Uh, he just DM'd me to tell my my dad that he said, "What's up?" He's a, he's a great kid, man. And he's, like you said, he's playing really well in the G League. He's killing it. And I know when his time, was, when his time comes, he's going to definitely answer. I could see him being called up soon. Utah, you know, they're a little guard-heavy team. But eventually, as he continues to dominate, he'll easily get a call up. And I'm sure you agree with him. He already got a call up, but he didn't, get, he didn't actually get to play. But this summer will be big for him. He'll probably uh, be back on the summer league roster, if not with Utah, with somebody else. And he really got to showcase what he can do, and hopefully he'll be on that, that opening day roster on, a, on one of the NBA teams next year. You're one of the greatest Hofstra players ever. How did it feel for it to become full circle, getting your number 10 jersey retired? I mean, it's another dream come true. Like, when I was picking a school, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I was going to have my jersey retired somewhere and and be one of the all-time greats there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy how how this life has played out for me, I'll tell you that. So you're a coach today, and you're a coach by Jay Wright at Hofstra, and Greg Popovich, and Don Nelson. What have you taken from those guys, not just as a player, but to use as a coach? I was lucky, man. I got, I, like you said, I played with uh, a number of great coaches. Uh, started off with Coach Wright. And Collis, then Larry Brown, which you didn't mention, he's a, he's a great coach too. Um, so I was just fortunate enough to to be able to to learn how to play the right way. Um, they really taught me the game of basketball, and that's something I think I would take with me um, in the coaching profession. Do you consider Allen Iverson one of the greatest point guards or guards in NBA history? Absolutely. I mean. To do what he did at his size is tough. I mean, you can't take anything away from him. He's definitely one of the greatest of all times. Were you on the team for the 2000 NBA playoffs against the Lakers? Yeah, that, was my, that was my rookie year. I tore my ACL uh, that year. So I wasn't playing, but I was, I, I was on the team. Oh, so you saw the Tyronn Lue step over firsthand? Oh, uh, yeah. I was caught side for that one. Oh, man. <laughs> I think that was AI's best year of his career right there. I mean. And to, to witness that firsthand and being a fan of AIs before that and then being able to watch them for that whole year dominate, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, firsthand and, you know, as a young kid. All right, guys, that's episode seven of Inside Buzz. I'm your host, Mikey Domagala. Speedy, thanks for coming on. Oh, man. Thanks I'll, for having me. I'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. All right, very good.